Hello, this is Kate McKinnon from the Contemporary Geometric Beadwork Project, and I'm going to show you something fantastic that you can do with simple triangles. This is a flat peyote triangle that I did in size 10 cylinder beads, large beads. You can work in this size if you like. Uh, they make beautiful machines. It's easy to see what you're doing. The technique is a start of just three beads in the center three increase strips and peyote fill in between. And there are lots of instructions on making peyote triangles online and also on our website if you'd like to learn the triangle. Once you've learned the triangle, if you'd like to make 18 of them, six each of three designs, see how I've got here, three different little triangles, and we will then assemble them into this beautiful little quilt, which is what I call the flower net assembly, and 18 triangles makes three of these spaces. Each one of these is fun to play with like a little toy. This is called a flexagon, and you can fold these out of paper, but basically it will show you all of the different faces of your design, and in addition to being incredibly fun to play with, it will also, if you have enough units, be wearable as a bangle. I made this one as a turning toy, so you can see that I would need one more to be able to slip my hand through it, or just simply a clasp here if I wanted to wear it as a bracelet like this, to be able to take it off, put it back together, and amaze my friends. Because look, this is not only a flexagon, and how does it flex, by the way? It folds flat. It knows just what to do. So fold it flat, and then have fun uh, actually turning it inward from the center. Wow! How cool is that? Into the different faces of your cycle. And remember, there'll be something on the back side too. You can see how this one, because it's not folded of paper, well, there's a lot to stuff in there. <laughs> but it's willing. And it'll actually turn. And not only will it fold that way, it'll also fold in the other direction. Uh, works the same way. It's just kind of interesting to note that it has these different behaviors. And this is the machine that Richard Feynman, Martin Gardner were playing with in, you know, in primary school, trying to count all of the different ways these things would cycle and how to turn them to do so. What I'd like to point out to you is that this is so much more than a flexagon though, because if you treat these little parallel lines here as verticals, all you have to do is pinch these faces together and you can see that they spring right away into the cycling machine of mirror tetrahedra. Now, because we're only using 18 triangles and not four, uh, not 24, this face here is empty. But you can see how simple it would be if you wanted to, to just place this triangle in here and sew it in. We're using size 15 of beads to make the joins, and this is just zipping where one round of beads secures the other. You can join pieces with one round of beads and you can separate one round of thread to separate the work as well. We have a lot of neat techniques upcoming in our new book, the Contemporary Geometric Beadwork Pattern Book, and this piece is one of the things that we show to illustrate the joy of triangles. So if you would like to make a cycling machine, and who wouldn't, Follow along with me as I show you how to join, first of all, this flat flower net. Oops, I'm all tucked in my own shorts here. There we go. This flat flower net, and then uh, we'll play with cycling it into different sorts of machines, and then we'll join it into a kaleidocycle, either by simply making these three joins here at the tips, and that's really all you would need if you wanted this to be a simple open cycling machine, or by adding another face, right, and sewing it in as well, or by treating this edge of join beads, these decorative, at this point, tiny little beads, I could treat them as the first round of a new triangle and begin actually decreasing the fourth triangle in from this edge. So some things are more difficult to think through, like decreasing. Some things are more obvious, like simply sewing on the fourth face. 
all are possible. And I'd like to show you how to get to all of these different points. And uh, if I can ever stop playing with my flexagon, oh, perhaps I will. Let's take away the things that are in our way. This beautiful cycle by Claudia Furthner that shows the, the sameness and how sameness can be beautiful. These triangles are differentiated from the center out with a burst of color, but each triangle point is the same. So every time you turn it, it doesn't matter which direction you turn it from, you're going to see the same face pattern on the cycle. The hinges are beautifully done and the machine turns easily and cleanly with no extra room. And differentiation, Joke van Biesen did a magnificent pattern, very complex, in which the way that you turn the cycle depends on the picture you see. And so this face right here has two very different expressions. And this is the kind of surface that we use to describe a kind of a signaling skin. If you imagine a morphing surface on, say, a ship or an airplane, where the very skin itself could either be connected to send and receive signal or translate into a completely different animal. And I think this is a really interesting way to think about communication, morphing, and things that automatically self-organize, get together and figure things out. This reminds me a great deal of our community trying to figure out cycling machines. Very few of us were engineers or physicists, but we rapidly got together and understood the potential of looking like this versus looking like this. It turns out that the shape you are is the work you can do, and the design you are is the impression that you make. So I, I find this a very interesting study. Uh, also, people have questions about the ends of the triangles. Uh, is it important to have Sharp tips, round tips, should I put a bead on the corner or not? Well, I keep saying, yes, it all works. And here's a glorious example in which Claudia Furthner started out making triangles and ended up doing something rather different by leaving off the corners and joining at what turned out to be pedal tips to make a turning machine that really isn't different from the kaleidocycle. But oh my, what a glorious experience of freedom, looseness, and also of pattern, form, and design. Uh, so once you get used to the form, you can absolutely innovate like this. And you'll find that you can stick almost anything together in a ring. And as long as it's properly connected, it will turn and it will do different things. And absolutely, you can even go tiny, just like you can go huge. Pat Oliva's tiny size 15 beads, Claudia Furthner's large size 10 beads will show you it doesn't matter what size, it doesn't matter what ornament or embellishment, all of these things are going to end up with the same sort of cycling delight. So let me show you our different join methods and you can decide on your own what makes the most sense for you. This is a very straightforward join. It's called the jellyfish net and it's made of all 24 triangles. This is one of three sections, and half of it has already been folded into a jellyfish and sewn together. This is an older strip of beadwork that we've been playing with for a long time, and as you can see, it doesn't have all of the join beads installed around the edge. Uh, when we're playing, we tend to work strictly with components clean triangles without a lot of extra join beads or thread. And many people have asked, uh, why, don't I, why don't I keep my working threads? Well, this is the answer for us because right now we're playing and we're seeing how many different machines we can make in how many different forms. And if all of these triangles had long working threads attached to them, they'd be in our way. And if we knew exactly what we were going to make, well, that wouldn't be an exploration, that would be a pattern. And in that case, we might do things like build our triangles together in sets of two. 
some of which had hinges, or we might pre-install the join beads around the edges or pre-install decorative point beads at the tip. There are many things that we could do uh, to prepare for joining if we knew exactly what we were going to make and why. As I say though, in this case, we are exploring. So, my components are separate and clean. You see a little bit of thread here, but that's just because I ended up taking a round off of these triangles. I had originally made these 10 beads deep, or 9 beads deep, and changed to want to fit into a new machine of 8 beads. Right, that's how it went. And so I took off one of the edges, leaving me a very short tail that I don't want to forget about. So I trimmed it just to where I could see it, but where it won't be in my way. Do you know, another idea about whether or not to leave your working threads on your components is that it depends on what you're making your pieces for. <clears throat> Again, if you know what you're making, you're only making one of them, you're not making them for sale or professionally, then why not just go ahead and use one thread to make the whole thing? However, if you're working professionally, I think it's best to think like a tailor and finish each component as you make it and then use a clean thread to put it back together. Uh, the chains of tetrahedra though, once you know what you're doing, if you wanna just make a kaleidocycle, then you're probably just going to go triangle by triangle and just end up with a chain of tetrahedra tumbling out of your hand. And this can be intimidating to people who don't think about shape very often, which is why I developed the jellyfish net join so that we could do it in stages of three. This is one third of a long net join and each one of these little strips folds neatly into a mirror tetrahedra just by sewing up these little legs. So right here, the strip, the jellyfish join, folds up exactly like this, and you just sew these edges together. Whether you sew this one to this one first, or this one to this one first, just depends on how keen you are to get your needle into this at the very end. I tend to sew the more difficult one together first into the hinge. And the reason that I have usually join beads all the way around the edges of my jellyfish net is that I think it's easier once you get complex to just sew the join beads to the join beads or, you know, just to leave a little bit of extra in there so that you have something to sew to something when things get very tight here in the middle. You also have an opportunity to join these together directly, just like that, once the pieces together so that you don't have to sew all of the beads into the hinge. As you assemble this, you'll see how many choices you have, and all of them are right if they result in a chain of tetrahedra. People have preferences on how they join. So again, this is a kaleidocycle, and it also is a chain of tetrahedra, and it also is 24 triangles. So Having all three or all four of these triangles on at once can make it confusing for people who don't know how to get their needle in right away. Really, it's very simple. You just take it one join and one side at a time and then boo, there and there, you've got a tetrahedra. But I think the very easiest way to learn this is to sew up the flower faces. To make the flower face join, which has an open face in the in the kaleidocycle, right? Flower face join that folds into the beautiful hand puzzle and also into the simple machine with an open fourth face for you to ornament, fill, or add to as you like. The way to make this is by taking your 18 triangles and making three flower face designs. We don't need to join the three together yet. Let's just plan three of them and make them one at a time. So to do this, you're going to lay out your triangles so that the two top and the two bottom have their hot corners in the middle, right? their unique corners in the middle, just like these two have their flower centers pointed to the middle. And then these two in the middle, if they have hot corners, 
just be sure that they're pointing to one side or the other, not directly in the middle. And this just has to do with the fact that this layer will end up going in a different direction than the other two because this is a three-dimensional machine. So just be sure they're both pointing the same way. For example, you wouldn't put this triangle in pointing up unless that was your specific intention. If you want these to behave the same way, then we're making mirror images, one of the other, and that would be like that. So to make this, you can just take six of your triangles, two of each design, and then join them all together, either just with join beads, or if you'd like to try our hinged method, it's quite simple. We'll just put one more extra row of beads in between the top triangles. So six triangles to make a flower face. Let's do it together. I'm gonna to get my needle and thread. I'm ready to start sewing now. As you can see, I've put together one of the flower face joins with the join beads that I chose, so you can see what this will look like when I'm finished. I chose beads that are pretty obvious because I wanted you to be able to clearly see where the structure of the triangles was versus the structure of the join. And the join can be virtually invisible if that's what you'd like it to be. It can be made either of completely clear beads. We like the Delica number 141 for that. It's a completely clear glass and you see it here uh, on the edges of these triangles to make the flower petals pop. So you can do your hinges in completely clear or you can do them in beads that match the colors of the triangles in question and provide a seamless look. As I say, for this piece, I want you to see the join beads. Uh, the only uh, hinge I've put in so far is this top one here. And you can see that I have just added one little row of beads, just one, two, three, four, five, six beads to my eight bead triangles. And this makes a really smooth, fluid hinge. It doesn't bother the rest of the flower form. It's a little bit warpy anyway because of the triangles, and this is just part of the thrill of it all. So there'll be a hinge here, hinge here, and a hinge here on this side. So three hinges, two, three. Right now, though, we're just making the flowers, so we're leaving off the side hinges. This is a, I think it's a really beautiful project. And this, of course, all on its own, knows what to do to make a set of mirror tetrahedra. Isn't that beautiful? That's just one little flower face. So my favorite way to join these is exactly like this and then to either leave this face open, maybe tighten it up a little bit by going in with another pass or two on the join beads or set something fascinating inside. We've got some neat ideas about what you could use as a fourth face when you have time to think about it, contemplate, uh, so that's what this this attachment method is really neat for, is for finding a really interesting and perhaps unexpected fourth face. If this was a pattern, uh, you know, like the other patterns we've released, we'd have all four of our faces made in advance, we'd know what we were going to do, we'd probably plan these so that they had join beads already attached. But here we're working on the fly, designing from components. So. I'm going to sew these together in the way that I normally do and I'm going to just pass my needle through a few beads to get anchored. I'm not a big knot tire. I don't object to them. I just tend not to do it if I can weave in instead. There are certainly times to use a knot. My favorite tactic is to simply change direction and begin sewing. So this is generally all I do to get started. I make a little loop of my thread, a directional change, and you know, if I tug on it, it's very hard to move, so that's a good sign. I'll go through a few beads, and I will consider my thread ready and raring to go. So the first thing that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put join beads around the edge. Again, yes, this could be done with working threads, but this is a free exploration. So this is what we're doing. We're going to do the join beads with a fresh thread, and I am going to completely encircle this triangle with these little tiny red beads. I have a choice now whether to even put beads in this space or at the tip or on the other side. 
I could absolutely leave it at that and it will be enough. As you can see on my roll model here, I decided to put the beads all the way around the edge. For this particular segment though, why don't I use the absolute minimum? If you think of this as the maximum, shoot, I even have two beads at every tip for a froth of these things. Why don't I try this one with the minimum? So in my mind, that would be leaving off this bead and this bead in the join and only addressing one, two, three, four, five beads for the joins. In this case, I would just walk my needle through the beads until I come to the next place in line. That was going to get a join bead. So I'd come down one more bead and then once again begin placing the joins. This is so absolutely a matter of design preference, how you do this, what they look like, whether you use hinges at all, that you should absolutely please yourself. But if you've never done it before, this right here, just using the very minimum number, might be the very easiest. And then when I'm done, we can compare the look of this one with the one that's completely encrusted. So I'm just putting these five beads on each side of this triangle. And I can get to the other side however I like. I'm choosing to go through the edge of this triangle. I try not to go too deeply into my components as I do these joins and my tension is fairly loose. I want to be able to take this apart if I don't like it and put it together in a different way. So this is components exploration and I'm joining accordingly. I'm using fairly short threads. None of them are building threads. None of them are leftover threads. And I'm tacking things together to see how they feel and how they look. Whatever path you take through these components is fine. Any, any needle path that gets you joined up in a clean way without putting too much thread in the beads is by definition fantastic. I tend to adapt my thread path to you know, whatever situation I find myself in. Try to be adaptable. Try never to pull things too tight. Leave loops of thread or put too much thread inside the beads. Now I'm on the other starting side here. I'm going to put in the missing three beads and this triangle will be ready to begin joining. So if I were writing a pattern for this, I would probably include these five join beads on each side of this particular design of the kaleidocycle. Now, I'm going to pass back through the very first few beads that I put on. And I am now free to get rid of this tail, which makes me very happy. And again, if you see me do this and just leave a little snitch, I want to know where it is, but I do not want it in my way. So now I am ready to join. I tend to lose track of what I'm doing as I'm sewing, so I'm frequently going back to my model and checking what's up. And so now I can see that I'll be joining these two like this double checking. <laughs> yes. And I tend to hold my triangles, my pieces to be joined together like this so that I can clearly see. One of the things about using these clear glass beads is that it can be a little bit challenging sometimes to see them. So if you have vision problems, you may not enjoy them as much as we do. To join these beads, these I have many choices. My favorite thing to do is actually to make my top thread over my final beads. This is a nuance that matters not at all. However you get them together, as I say, is by definition beautiful as long as it's strong and neat. Just lace these beads together. I like to hold them firmly in my hand like this so they can't get away. 
Every time I do this, I sew at least one triangle askew as if I've buttoned my coat wrong. <laughs> and I certainly sew at least one in at the wrong angle and have to take it out and do it again. So I just try to stay in the moment. Again, this is how I like to end these stitches. I like to go across the cylinder beads and not ask the join beads to take all the work. Whenever you do something like that, of course you're running the risk of a loop, so you try not to leave one. Now, from this thread angle, I have many opportunities. What I'm really trying to do is get my needle out here or out here. And since this was the very first joining round, I think I'm going to make the decision to actually pass back through it to get where I want to go. This can do no wrong. And it's never a bad idea to give a little more attention to where you start a piece. So now I'm just following the natural path of the beads just to move my needle into a position where it'll be easier to start the next side. And I'm simply putting five beads on every single side, whether there's a hinge or not. At this point, I'm going to leave the join and travel up through this triangle. You can see how the clear beads present a bit of a problem. It's easy to miss one. So be mindful if you're using them. And I've come to the end of my triangles. This is another good time to point out that if you want ornamental beads on your ends, you have, oh, pardon me, you have a lot of opportunity to put them in. So if you have a fancy for crystals or other things like that that might not be so healthy for your thread, wait until the end and treat them as an embellishment. Right now, I'm simply going to turn the corner and move my needle down to the next place for a join bead. And you notice I'm not pulling the thread tight. It already gets uh, excited enough once it's all joined together. There's no need to give it extra tension here. So I'm going to put in the five beads, and then immediately I will join this to its rightful partner, uh, hopefully in the correct order and at the correct orientation. I laugh because I cannot envision a day in which I'll do anything perfectly from beginning to end. I marvel at those who have the skill, but it's not one that I own myself. Once in a while, too, I'll see an actual red delicate cylinder bead in my mix here. If I get one of those in here, and I will, <laughs> by mistake, I'm not too worried about it. My motto as always with these is to not sweat the small stuff. So now I want to make sure that I've got my pieces correct. I'm going to come back to my role model here, figure out where I am, aha, here I am, and then know that my next triangle is this one. Ah, I see I've been working this way though. It's the same. Remember, it's just a mirror image. If I want to continue on as I was before, then this is the next triangle, and it will go like this. It's so easy to get flipped that you simply have to expect that it will happen and be flexible. It doesn't matter if you end up going to the left when you were previously going to the right. It only matters that your triangles are on in the correct orientation. Now, if you're getting fancy and things aren't the same from the front and the back, say you've got a layered piece, well, then you, you can't get away with that sort of freewheeling, right? So I'm going to check again, check again, and then I'm going to align them, check again, <laughs> and then I'm going to hold them up together like this. And I tend to clutch them like grim death, whether or not I have my join beads in. I find out what's going to happen next, and I go with it. So you can put these join beads in before or after you pick up the triangle. But once I've gone to the rather extreme bother, right, of checking, triple checking, and quadruple checking my triangle to make sure it's in the right orientation, I tend, as I say, to just cling on and do the whole thing at once. The clear beads, again, presenting 
a little bit of a visual challenge. Okay, so this is only five beads, right? Very low stakes here. And then I'm going to continue clutching. Ah! And make sure that my coat's buttoned properly, right? As I say, I always manage to get off by one at some point or the other. The base triangles are the same here. I'm going to bring my thread from the cylinder bead to the cylinder bead. And then begin to lace in the join beads. If I decide, after looking at this, oh no, I like the first one better with join beads everywhere. Well, it's a simple matter for me to just fill in the gaps. I can just run around the edge and add whatever embellishment I like. And if you're the sort of a person who likes to use, say, silk threads or oh, a little fringe, some sort of fine ornamentation on the edge of a thing, well, that last pass is a beautiful time to do that. And I try to save any ornament like that for a moment after the structural work is done. Now, before I carry on, yes, it's beautiful. I'm going to confirm it. And at that moment, I'll pull my join beads a little more snugly. And I'll have the opportunity then, should I choose to do so, to connect these two cylinder beads at the end. I think that's important. And this is how I like to do it. At that point then, it's very easy for me to just go back through this bead and continue the thread path of the triangle. And I will do that, re-sewing, reinforcing the edge. And then I'll come down the two spaces until it's time to put in the next join bead. Put in my five beads. You see how bent my needle is? I tend to work with it this way so I don't correct it. But the way that my hands work, I always have a big bend in my needle right there. All right, so I've got those five join beads in. Now, ah, oh, how lovely. Not a thing I need to do because those are just going to be the ones that join it to the next part of the machine. I think in the beginning I had the idea that I wasn't going to put any beads around the outside of the edge but I could see how it would really break the flow. So I'm sticking with the minimum, but I did decide to get them in along the edge. Now, five join beads that will be for the center of the flower face and put the other blue point triangle in. So one, two, three, four, and five. Come here, little bead. And now I'm ready to join. Uh, this will be pretty simple. Yes. <laughs> the two blue points go together. And I'll hold them up here. Attempt to make sure my coat is buttoned properly. And then, as I mentioned before, I like to cross from cylinder bead to cylinder bead. And then pick up the lacing. And if this were a hinge that I were making, instead of just a face join, I would definitely be reinforcing that first stitch. As it stands now though, these guys need a little room in the beads because they're going to have to do more connecting than this before the day is done. And so I don't think there's any point in asking them to carry extra thread right now. So right now, I'm just lacing in the joins and doing really no reinforcing other than being very mindful of places that I start and stop my thread. Okay, and then I'm gonna come out to, oops, I come out in one of the cylinder beads, the side I'm leaving. And then I will move over to the side I am traveling to 
to continue the piece. And I'm facing an unuseful direction. So I'll turn myself around and look at that. At one point, I actually added a decorative bead to the tip. You can see how if you add that at the beginning as you're making the piece, you can just use it, ignore it, pony off of it as you travel along. I'm not concerned that I have that one odd tip in my piece. I mean, frankly, if you look carefully at my pieces, you'll see all manner of unusual moment. <laughs> I tend to celebrate error or unexpected change of direction and often leave a symbol of my excitement along the way. I may have wanted to remember that corner. You see me too turning my hands to help the thread. This is just part of the ergonomic way that I try to pay attention to beading. If I'm having one hand do all the work of pulling all the thread through and this one stays still, I find that my hands get tireder in a less healthy way than if they're all working together. So there we go, I've got the outer join beads in and now I'm ready to come up around the corner and pick up that little light bulb flower petal. So I'm leaving off the beads at the edge. I'll travel over around the tip and then I will bring my needle up through the bead where I'm ready to make the join. And I will lay in the five join beads And now it's time for me to orient my next triangle. Just like that, just like that. Again, I like to fold these guys away when not in use. Uh, these cycles are very good about folding. Okay, and then again, make sure that my coat is buttoned properly. Cling on like grim death. I go across the cylinder bead and into the join bead. You can reinforce that one cylinder bead if you're sure of what you're doing and you're finishing a machine. Again, I am exploring and so I'm making useful and sturdy but not reinforced connections. Do you ever stab yourself in that fourth finger? I do. Okay. And here is the last join of this round. And then I'm going to come up through the cylinder bead of the triangle that I'm leaving and pass through the cylinder bead of the triangle that I am moving to. And then I'll evaluate my situation. Oh. I just need to get out to the edge here to leave some beads. You see how that is a very active gap? I think when I see things like that, I reinforce them on the spot. That's an example of something that is asking for more sturdiness. And my guess is the reason is because of the beads in the clear light bulb petal. They are at a bit more of a curve. They're more active, they're more springy, and so they're less inclined to take direction. So I am reinforcing the, actually the entire tip of this little light bulb triangle in response to its extreme springiness there. I like that better. See, everyone's behaving themselves. And it's still very nice and pliable. So into the next triangle come down to the space where the next beads start. I'm going to put five beads here, round the corner, five beads here, and then I'm going to build the hinge. Be right back. Now I've completed the join beads around the edges of all of the triangles. I've checked to make sure that they're correctly placed. And now I'm ready to do the final join, which will be the hinge on these beads. So I'm going to get my needle oriented correctly or, this is a little trick I like, just 
anchor through the thread so that I can pass back through the same bead again. And then I'm going to add in the hinge beads. Now, on the flower form where I had join beads going all the way around the triangles, I had six hinge beads. In this one, there are only space for four. That's not important though, because you can always add beads or subtract them in this exploration method where we're just using short threads and finished components. There's no penalty for using too few or too many beads. We just go in and fix it. So let me then just finish the hinge. I like to fold it over as ever. And I'll pick up the beads that did not get included in the last pass. Now, there are many ways to do this, many ways to lace hinges, many bead choices. Again, this is a situation where if it works and it's neat, you did a fantastic job. There's no one way to do this. If you look at our cycles, you'll see that the hinging is uh, various and delightful. Now, I'm just going to pass back up through this hinge with my thread just a little bit to make sure that it's secure. So this will be the third trip through this hinge, and I may choose to vary my thread path right, so that I'm including both sides of the beads. I may want to actually, this be one of the things I reinforce right here, but I think it's it feels good enough. You can kind of tell when you put your needle in how much thread it has, whether it needs a little bit more. And I think everything in here feels really good. I did notice one place, ah, right there, where I think that this single thread here is going to definitely want to be a double. Let me get this in focus for you. This one right here, I just think is a little bit weak. So when I come to something like that in the machine, you see the rest of these got a pass, an extra pass through that thread. When I come back to this one in my sewing, I will take another pass through those two beads. Otherwise though, I think this looks fantastic. And so I'm actually going to end my thread by burying it in one of the triangles. And I'm gonna to wanna to follow a very natural thread path to do this. I tend to avoid the edges when I'm burying thread and I favor the center of the triangles. And the triangles don't mind this either, as long as there's room in the beads. And so that's another reason I favor trying to make each triangle with just one thread and one pass so that there is room in the beads to go back in, hide thread, or do new structure. Now I'm going to come all the way out here. As I say, I don't like to involve edges, but then I can always just step back. Sometimes that's the easiest way to stay away from an edge is to pass through it and then step back through, perhaps in another direction. So I feel quite certain that this hinge thread is not going to come back to bite me. Right? And I'm going to go ahead and trim it. Now that I'm completely done with the sewing here, we can compare this finished flower paste join to this one. The more join beads, the more cluttered, but they both work exactly the same way. Each one of them is ready to become a working set of mirror tetrahedra. So one's just more visually cluttered. I tend to prefer the minimalist look, but the join beads, if planned for, can be a really exciting component in the design. Now, once you've made three of these, you have the opportunity to either sew them directly together onto a machine, remember these will be hinges, or join them first individually into tetrahedra. What I like to do is join them into a cylinder like this so that we can play with the cylinder and experience it as a flexagon before we actually do the final assembly. So I encourage you to, just for the sake of fun, go ahead and finish your machine just like this. Sew three of these and hinge them together into a cylinder. Let me complete, I'm actually going to leave this just as it is so that we can experience this in the cylinder and see how differently it reacts, it looks, it feels. And we can always take these extra join beads off if we want to. We can always add more on here. Let me go ahead and make this other 
flower face and then we'll connect our three into a ring and compare its movement to this, both in terms of a flexagon and a wannabe kaleidocycle. Back with you shortly. So these are my three segments, my three flower assemblies joined. Two of them have a minimal number of joined beads in bright red. And the third one here on the right has an excessive number of joined beads in red. It even has two at every triangle tip, which is clearly purely ornamental. I like the way that they gather in the center. I think that's really beautiful, but they make for a bulkier look in and around the edges. You can look at the flow of the pattern, the confetti and all of that. It's not really affected by all of the red, but the pink and the yellow, especially where you see the clear, is dramatically affected. So I've been staring at this for a little while, and I think that I'd still like to go ahead and put the machine together uh, using the arrangement exactly as it is so that once we have our little cylinder set up, we can evaluate how the hinge beads look in the whole collection. So let's get some hinge beads out and join this here and here, and then take a look at it again. And this is another lesson about weaving in thread. It's really easy to start a new thread. There's no need to take long threads through the body of a piece just to get to where you need to go when it's so easy to just start a new one in place. And so I tend to use a lot of short lengths of thread like this, and I just make sure that I'm changing direction and weaving my thread in appropriately before I start. And that way, when I'm finished, I'm free to just cut the end because I've already woven it in, right? So right here is where the new hinge should be. And I'm going to begin by placing the beads, delicate beads, for the half of the hinge. And we'll be placing four of them to match these existing components. I'm starting to feel so substantial in my hands, so much like an integrated living piece of fabric. It's rather extraordinary how much life these machines have. They're very, very different than just a pile of triangles. Now let me make sure I got my hinge in the right place. <laughs> Looks good. Okay. And then I'd like to reinforce this last stitch. Right. Since this is a hinge, it pays to really do this right. So I'm going to come up through these beads and back into the hinge. Okay. Now, hinge feels good, beads feel natural, I'm ready to make the join. I can fold up the extra beads behind me. Okay. Now I'm just joining these two triangles together. Okay. And this is just my first pass through the hinge. I will definitely come back and take a second. Well, if you can catch two beads at once with your needle, that's a time saver. If not, it's fine to just go through one bead at a time. Best to be sure you know what you're doing than to save time. Now, to finish this hinge, 
I'm going to be sure to go through the end sets of beads, which in this case are two small round red seed beads, twice. And then take another pass down through the delicate beads. Watch out for caught threads. Okay. I'm going to take my final pass down through this hinge. <laughs> Sounds of life. And then to finish the hinge, I'm going to reinforce these two beads here at the end. And then I'm going to bring my thread back down into the body of the beadwork. And now I have a little flower quilt. And I'm free to observe it before it's sewn into the cylinder. I can check it for fit. I think I mentioned on the other one that I could close it into a bracelet if I just had three. Well, this one is significantly smaller because I used eight bead triangles instead of nine bead. And so this one does not fit me as a strap band without a little extra something on the back. So if I wanted to make this one into a bangle, I would probably need five seconds, five sections. Whereas with this one, with the slightly larger beads, I think I could probably get into four. So we're not making a bangle right now, but I think it's worth thinking about the excitement of wearable art, not just turning toys. I've now completed the sewing of this final hinge. It's just the same as all the others to join these three flower forms into a cylinder. And this one is going to look and feel very different than the first one. First of all, it's smaller in size of triangle. This is nine beads per side and this is eight. Secondly, this one is hinged side and top. And this one was hinged only at the top and the sides are just a net join. It feels bulkier. Uh, I sewed all the way up to the edge of each triangle because this one was meant to be a flexagon. And the less space, the better for exploring it as a turning machine, right? As it turns out, the play that hinges give a piece like this are exactly what take away from its ability to perform as a folding flexagon or a cycle. So I sewed this one a little tighter and it shows. And isn't it interesting all of the different forms this flexagon can take, right? This one is meant to be a little bit different and it's got the hinges in all three places. This was built to be a kaleidocycle, not a flexagon. It wants to be dimensional it's hinged for easy movement, and right now it's ready to accept either a fourth face, right? the triangles can just drop in here really fairly easily and complete the kaleidocycle, or you could imagine leaving these open and having the excitement of seeing inside the tetrahedra when that shape comes up, or putting something else in there to see. I have some ideas of my own. I wonder what you will come up with to put in those forms, put inside those tetrahedra. So I'd like to show you how to join this into a cycle and leave the face open. I think it's fairly easy to see how we'd sew the other triangle on, but we're going to do that too. We'll do it all. And then I'd also like to show you how to decrease this open space into triangles that you build on the spot. And that just involves treating this outside round as an actual row of the next triangle in place. And you can see that the busy one, the busy one with join beads at every place will be perfect for this. So this is the, this is the flower face that I'll experiment showing you how to do a decreasing triangle in for your fourth face. I'll leave this one open so that we can enjoy that open. And then in this little segment, I'll go ahead and add the two triangles from a fourth pattern so that you can see all of the options in one little machine. But for now, those of you who are just learning this form should spend your time assembling 
6 times 3, 18 of your triangles into the flower form cylinder and play with it and come to understand how much this wants to be a lively machine and how it started just from six simple triangles arranged into a flower form times three. To hold it is to understand that the machine is a form of nature and the mirror tetrahedra is just one of the many things a hexagon can grow up to be. For more on these beautiful forms and to follow along with our entire exploration, please find us online at contemporarygeometricbeadwork.com and you can see the entire progression of these ideas from idea to finished form.